Hey everybody, this is Stu Smith and Jeff Nichols back with the Tactical Fitness Report and we are going to go right into a discussion of both of our methodologies. Like how did we create our system, our programs? You know, what is the maybe some of the science behind it, some of the experiences behind it and why have they evolved the way they have? So, you know, Jeff, you're the man. <laughs> you you want me to start first, or you can? Yeah, you guys, it's your podcast. You All right, so I'll, I'll start off with experience. Right, <laughs> mine started off with high school experience, even pre high school experience. I started lifting weights probably when I was thirteen years old, and I didn't have anything but Joe Weider books and Arnold Schwarzenegger magazines. Right, so it was a bodybuilding style program until I got high school. And then when I got to high school, that's when athletics really kicked in and they started, we do it powerlifting. And so that was where I kind of cut my teeth. Right. And, you know, we even had a powerlifting team in high school. So that was really good for technique and progressions and, you know, strength that, that went right into, um, you know, football and shot put and, you know, baseball, it kind of screwed me up. Um, but, uh, um, but anyway, and track and things like that. So, um, that was where it kind of, that was my ed beginning education. Let me, uh, let me get just kind of one deeper. That. Let me interview you for a sec. So just, is there something in your, like in your mind, like in who you are, the makeup of like, wh why did Stu Smith start lifting weights at 12 and 13 years old? Like, that's the question that I have for you. That's a good question. You know, I, I don't know. I remember just wanting, um, you know, back when you had a, you didn't have the internet, right? You, you had magazines and you had books and uh, I had a Sears catalog and I remember going through the Sears catalog and there was this concrete set of weights that I wanted for Christmas. Right, yeah, and it was a big, thick Sears catalog. Yep, right? yep. Yeah, 110, yeah. Pound, 110 pounds of weights with a bench, and <laughs> it was even a hollow bar, right? And uh, just concrete weights. Yeah. Oh yeah. Concrete weights, and that was my that was my first set of weights. And I just wanted it. I don't really know why. I just felt the need to do it. I will say this: there were some kids that were older than me you know, that were really good examples, I would say that, that, you know, maybe three or four years older than me in my neighborhood, you know, I knew they were in high school and they were always lifting weights and, you know, it, it, I think it just kind of, I, I saw that and I saw the guys I wanted to be. I also saw the guys I didn't want to be right yeah. along that journey. Yeah. And uh, I think that that was a very big help. In fact, the other day I was, I was saw on Facebook, you know, and I said, Hey, you know, you, you really motivated me to, to want to train and do stuff, it, you, you know, and, uh, it was, it was fun to, you know, communicate with them like that. Cause like I said, you, you look up to guys that are three years older than you, you know, when you're in high school or not even in high school yet, you know, yeah. now it doesn't yeah. make that big a difference. You know, 10 years doesn't make a big difference when you're 40, but <laughs> right. You know, but so yeah, that was, that was kind of journey. That's where I cut my teeth in fitness and I really loved it. Um, yeah. and it really kind of guided me through everything. Right. And yeah, I knew I wanted to serve. So I was lucky enough to get into the Naval Academy, worked hard through that, you know, saw the spec war stuff. And then I really didn't, I still didn't have a, a system. I had never really started creating workouts. I just used what was all around me. Right. And I saw the guys that were older than me at the Academy that were preparing for buds and saw what they did. And, and that kind of evolved with it. We, we were lucky to have some active duty seals there that kind of guided us a little more. They were more yeah. gut checks more than anything though. They really weren't a system. Um, uh, but I, I really didn't d create a system until after my time at the team, I, I did a, a tour with SDVs. And the one thing I noticed there is that everybody was lifting in the winter, right? We were lifting hard and right, yeah. late fall, early winter because we needed to put on about 10, 15 pounds of mass to go yeah. diving in the winter, you know, Atlantic yeah. ocean oh, yeah. in the winter <laughs> just sucks. Right? Did you, did you ever dive up in Washington state? 
never did not that but it was you know you know and uh, Atlantic Ocean and the, you know, even in the mid Atlantic region, oh, it's terrible. 35, yeah. 40 degree water yeah. in the winter. I mean, it's awful, you know, yeah. and, uh, Oh, cause that you're, you're East coast all time too. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's, yeah. Right. So, that's so right. You really needed to, um, you know, learn how to uh, put on some masks and, and, yeah, and just, so I saw yeah. a tactical advantage to it, which I loved it because I hadn't really lifted a lot of weights, you know, pre buds, post buds, you know, it was just, always running and calisthenics and doing yeah. stuff like that. So I saw that cycle and I did notice the one thing that helped me is it dropped my mileage down. It dropped my high reps down. So I felt like my joints were getting stronger. So yeah. through that experience, I was like doing well, a combination of like you lift heavy in the winter or for the winter, right? You see all that stress, you end up in the water. Yeah. Right? yeah. It's not super therapeutic when it's really, really cold but offloading your spine like that in the ocean. That's the one thing like in second phase, people put their natural body weight back on typically in second yep. phase. Is yep. it's not that the second phase isn't difficult. It's it's way it's more difficult than first phase, but it's just buds that we're talking about. Yes. But um it's just the offloading, like not having to deal with gravity, yep. right? Elongation of the of the spine and stuff. We tend to it it's interesting like so you have all these historical sort of cause effect that always historically worked, right? Mm -hmm. And that's an observation that Stu sees. Stu sees his team doing this. Well, why are they doing this? Oh, if you pay attention to the job, it tends to make sense. So right, and plus that second phase, you know, you're you're diving on pure oxygen. Yeah, the last half yep. of the phase under pressure. So you know, it tends to uh, that combined with you know zero gravity of diving. Yeah. You know, everybody scores get better and you know, yeah, it, so. it heals tissue tissue tends to heal a little bit better provided you know because for me for example in buds in second phase like by that point my sleep routine was good like i was sleeping through the night every night you know certainly there's still stress involved and whatnot but uh if you start looking at the, the physical bodies of everyone post pool comp pre and post pool comp yeah. Right. Cause hell week. And then you join the second phase and you heal up post hell week. And then there's still that stress. And then post pool comp, everyone just grows. That's a good point. Stress gets yeah. Kind of, yeah. Uh, Muscle mass grows and lean body mass. Yeah. All that's good. Yeah. yeah. You just see healthier tissue guys are lean, but they kind of look, Oh man, like overtrained. Yes. Post pool comp. Everyone gets, it stays very lean in the musculature. You know, just we mature. It's like, it's not that that stress doesn't go away, but I think that emotional stress, because you have hell week, then you have pool comp, that emotional stress tends to kind of go away, and confidence tends to, like, oh, I'm going to be here if I don't screw yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. And so you also get this maturing of this physical body because that fight or flight tends to get more towards just fight. Yeah, that's just, a really good point. Uh, yeah. You know, just your not only is the stress levels lower, but – your recovery is higher. Yeah. So right. like I have photos of all of my phases, pre and post phase, like pre second phase, post second phase. And if you compare them, they, you almost look at, it, it's like looking at my son this year at sixth grade. Yeah. And we took a photo first day and then last day and you're like, wow, like granted he's grown, yeah. but there's this maturation that happened. Like you look not old, but he got older and that's what you look like. You look like there's that point in buds where you just see people go, holy crap, they just matured. Yeah. Well, that, that's a really good point. And that's why you, you want to do periodization style training like that, because you do reduce the stress levels on your body. You do, or at least change them, right? Change. Yeah. It's changing forces. The stimulus. Yeah. It is, is, is sometimes all that's necessary. It's not like we want to offload but sometimes right. a change just works so that's where i learned about periodization and then started studying it and doing you know work through like studying the books of you know national strength and conditioning association their their cscs program and get, get getting into the physiology of it at one point i was actually thinking about becoming a doctor i liked it so much yes yeah, right? and yeah, then i realized i was like damn that. eight years yeah. of school <laughs> eight more years school. <laughs> well yeah it was, that's what i'm saying you're talking about like off camera like the idea phase like that sounds like a great idea and then you go to enroll and you're like i'm not doing another eight yeah years. i was like you know that, that that was a good gut check for so anybody you the doctors out there 
Good job. That <laughs> yeah, is no like thanks. Yeah, academic I, buds. Um, but yeah, so uh, once I left the team, I was really fortunate. I went back to the Naval Academy, and I really kind of needed it because even though I was lifting and, and do it, I just I never really stopped doing a lot of the other things. So if you look at my history from like 18 years old, 19 years old, when I started the whole prep of, uh, you know, you're still in athletics, still playing a pretty hard athlete, athletic sport like rugby and getting injured and, you know, those trauma type injuries. And then going through my 20s through buds, post buds. I never really had a cycle that I was working. I flirted with a cycle in the winter, like I said, a couple of winters. But after that, it was, it was still high volume, high run. You know, it was just – so by 30, I was literally broken. Everything on my body was really messed up. And I showed up at the academy – Still in good shape, able to do stuff, but just everything hurt. I mean, no, nothing was working right. Uh, I saw myself really kind of deteriorate in my numbers. Um, I could still lead a hard PT and do stuff like that, but it just, I was just hurting. Right? Pay for it, yeah. Way, I, I mean, I felt old, you know, at 30. <clears throat> so I, I, said, I went back to where I cut my teeth in fitness, and I started doing a bodybuilding cycle in the first winter I was there. You know, so it was a lot of isolation. Your joints stopped hurting, didn't they? Yeah, you know, it was a lot of isolation exercises. It was, um, uh, you know, everything from curls, leg extensions, hamstring curls. I mean, very basic stuff. I, I did do some compound movements, but nothing crazy. But I just needed to rebuild. I needed to rebuild my joints. I stopped running. I did all non-impact activity. And that was when I was like, I like this cycle. This cycle yeah. really helped me. And then... By the time spring came around, weather's nice. I was like, all right, I'm going to start progressing my running, start progressing my reps. Yep. And so I was like in my springtime training. And then by the summer, I felt really good. And I ramped it up to kind of see where my numbers were, see if I could peak in running and swimming and calisthenics. And then I was like, okay, I've done that. And I did everything I wanted to get back to my old scores now it's time to come back down. So the fall was more of a taper back into weight training again and non-impact activity. And that was when I created this little, I called it my solstice running program. So my year looked like a bell curve. So basically I would run in the summer up here and then not run very much the winter, yeah. in the winters. And so, you know, I realized that, well, that's a great running program that probably I would think in hindsight, that probably saved me more than anything from the massive injuries that were accumulating. And it was nothing major knee tendonitis. Yeah. You know, I did have a stress fracture that was major. Um, but you've done it for so long. Like you probably stopped and were just like, I'm just used to being in, in yeah. some level of discomfort that although it's inhibiting me, it's not stopping me. Mm -hmm. But after doing that for 10 years, you're like, Oh, it's starting to stop me. Yes. Good. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause uh, I had ankle surgery. Those were more traumatic type injuries, but yeah. uh, you know, the overuse injuries were, you know, tendonitis and you just couldn't you know, heal. Could you? Yeah. Everything yeah. Oh, I was always sick. Yeah. You know, all, every year I got sick, I got some kind of bronchitis or the walking uh, pneumonia after yeah, the bronchitis I, yeah. blue bugs, you know, whatever. I was just, my immune system was really low. Yeah. Um, and that's when I kind of came up with it. My first attempt at periodization was, uh, was this Maximum Fitness book. It's a 52-week cycle, and it actually has that same bodybuilding workout that I did back, back then. And uh, it's, that would be more of a bodybuilding-style program. The Tactical Fitness book that you see behind me has more of a powerlifting cycle in it. So there's a couple of different ways that you can lift, obviously. Um, yeah. So I've kind of evolved a little bit. I, I still go back to a, a kind of a basic, you know, bodybuilding cycle when I feel like I really need it. Um, the other thing that I've evolved over the years is I started adding a mobility day once a week. Yeah. Um, just took out a hard day and turned it into a mobility day of non-impact activity, stretching and foam rolling. Um, I do at the end of every workout, like this mini mobility cycle for about 10 or 15 minutes, but yeah. I'd say that that has been that has been the evolution of the the system and and the periodization program I create is really a a, a seasonal system. Now yeah. it's very flexible because you can't have a periodization without flexibility. I mean because you don't need 
a 12 week strength cycle sometimes. Maybe you just need six, maybe you just need four, right? Or yeah. you don't need a 24 week calisthenic running cycle. Maybe you need to cut that in half sometimes. So you got to listen to your body and, and know how that flows. But you know, I, for the most part, I kind of seasonally direct my programming to where I lift harder in the winter, run a lot less, do a lot more swimming, non-impact activity, swing it around to the spring, start ramping up running, calisthenics volume yep. picks up, weightlifting volume goes down. I still lift, just more supplemental. And then the, uh, you know, through the backside, into the fall, go back into the winter lift cycle again. So, and everything, and the cool thing about this cycle is that you can mix all the elements of fitness into your year without uh, causing any major disruptions in those uh, elements of fitness. What I mean by that, your strength and power, you know, you, you build it up, but you can maintain it. Your, your stamina and muscle and endurance you build it up in the spring and summer, but you maintain it a little bit. I mean, not, not with a lot of impact activity, but non-impact activity. Flexibility and mobility is done every day. And your um, you know, speed and agility cycles, you, know, you can throw those into the spring and the yeah. fall as you're decreasing or increasing your mileage. That's a good way to you know, work on some speed work right there kind of get your body used to some of the the impacts of it just a little bit a little bit tougher impacts you know force force impact but then you know then once you kind of get through that cycle you can start ramping up your mileage a little bit or come down you know depending on which yeah. side of the bell curve you're on that you know time of the year so that's that's how I've done mine and I'm you know and and you, you can hear mine has more to do with experience and less to do with science. However, throughout the years, I was able to learn more about science, tie science into it, understand it, and make those changes where, you know, experience was probably lacking compared to what the science uh, has out there. Right. So, but observationally, though, I mean, that's the end of the day. Like, you, you were, you've always observed, like, this is my, this is what I'm trying to do. You, this is the adaptation I'm, I'm hoping for. Is it delivering said adaptation? If it's not, then you make the change. If it is, you're like, uh, that's what you're seeing is over those years of observation, you, 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 you've noticed trends, yes. right? And at the end of the day, it's just work and work out, you know? So like looking at, it's interesting. It is, is like on paper, you and I look very different <laughs> from, a, from someone that's kind of an untrained eye. But if you and I were literally to put our programs, lay them out, and then look at what the cumulative work is every four to six months, it's going to be extremely similar. Oh, yeah. And, and the reason why is because neither Stu or I condense a timeline to appease someone's emotion. Like, oh, I'm really in a hurry. Like, <laughs> I'm going to make a quick program. It's like, no, no, no. Here is the program. Right. This is what we've seen observationally over time in our experience and in, in both parochial educational experience plus Stu and I living the life that we did and trying to apply it um, as we did as operators. So, I mean, at the end of the day, that's, that's why I, I will say that you can't dissect someone's program in a 12 or 16 or 18 or 20. You have to look and see what they're doing over the fiscal year. Like that to me is programming. If someone's like, well, I just, if someone is only able or typically is only writing, they're only writing like a speed program, or only doing a strength program, only just this all encompassing program that takes 30 weeks. You're like, but there's 52 weeks in the year. Right. And, and even somebody, I would say Stu would agree with this is that, Anyone that's in really good air quotes here, in good shape and preparing for buds, even the best athletes that we receive, right? When you when you receive an All American wrestler, Division One college wrestler, there's very little preparation that I'm anticipating having to have. Yet there is still preparation. Oh, there's a weakness right? somewhere. Yes, absolutely. And it's like, oh, you're an All American college football player. You're pretty prepared, but there are weaknesses, and that's the thing. Is like. It, weakness is not a negative like, oh, you're weak. It's like, all right, you've just emphasized so much on the strengths 
based on the sport that you've had to play competitively, the aspects of that sport have forced you to have some strengths, right, in life, and they've created some sort of weaknesses because of specificity. Sure. And so yeah. it's like we want to take the strengths that you have and expound upon them, and when you do expound upon overall strengths, you, your weaknesses go away. So, Jeff, let's hear your story. What What is your – uh, process that you've had through your journey into where you are now. Yeah, mine's uh, mine's not that dissimilar. You're right, right again, the thirty thousand foot view, not that dissimilar. Um, my my origin question is why did I start? Um, it's a, it's kind of a it's a short story, but I was a very like we all can look back in our childhood and you can remember even even as an adult right now when you see it when you see a child. It's like, whoa, that child is really small, like smaller than they should be. Like you're in seventh grade and you're four foot tall or me as a junior in high school and I hadn't even hit five foot tall yet. So, wow. Yeah. Wait, you know, I wrestled 103 all through high school up until my senior year. So it's like I and I was not malnourished. Um and you must go back to your high school or your hometown and just people. Oh, I'm, a, like, I'm a total anomaly because <laughs> now, now people remember me as like, I was, a, you know, come from a good family. Like I'm, I'm part of the Nichols family of people like, Oh, it's a good mom. My parents are fantastic humans. Yeah. G great humans. And so that that's the reputation of my mom and dad are like, Oh, Mr. And Mrs. Nichols are they're lovely people. Right. So I go back and, and I have my history, whatever. But, uh, Anyways, my, my story is pretty not, that's why I had a big chip on my shoulder as a kid and uh, long story short, my best friend since still is, you know, really like my best friend since third grade uh, wrestled at Iowa and so did his brother and their, and so on. And wow. his, their dad, so the mom is the head of the dentistry department at the university of Iowa, which is way cool. And then their dad has, has had his own dentistry practice forever. Well, long story short, you know, very athletic community. Um, my best friend's father played on a traveling softball team, like real competitive, like top 10 in the, in the world, you know, like fast pitch. Wow. So, yeah, he's like, so my dad, my best friend's dad, like I said, is a dentist practice, made good money. He had a big dentist practice, but the second floor was just all weights. He just bought all this, oh. he made this huge weight room. And I was like, oh. So we'd go up there and we'd go watch, like we'd be playing baseball, but then we'd, we'd be at the same baseball park and my son's, my, my best friend's dad would be playing softball. Bear with me, folks. Huh. So my best friend's father was an amazing, like I'm looking at this guy that was like at the time he was 38, 42, something like that. So old. Him and his guys and that team. I mean, because I remember they got ninth in, the, ninth in the world one year. They played in Kansas City, got ninth in the world fast pitch. And these men were hitting and running this ball like, holy crap. And so I correlated, like, weight room, because we'd always get down practice, and I'd go with my friend. We'd, we'd ride our bikes from the baseball diamond downtown, which is a very small town where his dad's practice was. We'd go upstairs, and right across the street was a soda shop. So we'd always go upstairs and get money from his dad to go across the street to the soda shop. But in upstairs in his garage, there are all had these giants like these 40 year old men from the, like there's this huge, huge steel plant, steel workers plant in my hometown, like iron workers, yeah. so you have iron workers. And these guys are just jack, like no pun intended, just jack and steel in my buddy's <laughs> uh, dentistry office above. And I was just fascinated because I saw the correlation between lifting weights and these dudes that would just mash and run. So in me, I was like, I got to work out. And so every single day from that point on, since I saw that gym when I was 12 years old, it's like, I've got to lift. I have to. If I want to hit the ball, I want to run fast, I got to do it. Yeah. So it just stuck with me at 12 years old. Same like you. I got the weights. I got all these sort of things because I was too embarrassed to go to a weight room because I was so small all the way through high school. Yeah. Um, it was, I was. I was just too embarrassed. And so I just on my waterbed doing dips and pull-ups and push-ups for years until I got, you know, I got into like high school when I finally was like, screw it. I'm going to go anyway. And I was, that's what drove me when I went to, when I went to the gym for the first time, I was the, like, now here's, here's why I was the smallest kid, male and female 
in my entire high school until I was in junior high school. All the girls, like the freshman girls were the same size as me when I was a junior in high school. <laughs> so I had a huge chip on my shoulder. So, you know, no big, no big surprise there. I overcompensated. I, I chose the, the, the most difficult path. Um, and for me, lifting weights and getting bigger and getting stronger, it was the one thing that I could control that I felt like I could control that would directly correlate into me being bigger, faster, stronger for whatever I wanted to do. So that persisted, right? I just, I just lifted, just lived in the gym. You know, I had my muscle and fitness subscriptions forever, right? The muscle development, I, all the weeder stuff, the, the Bible, like the Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah. encyclopedia, all that. And that, that's, that was, I, I, it was as if every single time I read through it and I closed the book, the next time I opened up is as if I never read it again. I was just deeply like looking for secrets, right? Yeah. Um, very few and far between, you know, got through high school, went into college. First time I ever had an actual strength coach uh, when I was at Troy University. And then I was, then, then I was able to actually put my, go, oh my God, there's, there's a profession that does that. Yeah, so there you go. I went from pre-med, I was pre-med chemistry. I switched my degree to exercise science and here we are, right? So, you know, as far as the methodology is concerned, um, you know, it, it stems from it, like pretty much everything in the United States initially, but it, a lot of it stems from American football. Like that's what the yep. weight room is, it's all about American football. And so that was my first exposure. But I realized very quickly that um, a lot of people don't, unfortunately, coaches, that women's soccer is not American football, right? Baseball is not American football. Like there really has to be a new approach to each sport. Although across all sports, most all sports, there's more similarities and differences. It's just that if you don't identify the, the difference is, then everyone just gets, you know, everyone typically gets overtrained. So now <laughs> taking that same football methodology and, and then, as a student, you know, as a young college student, I got to buds and was going through buds. I was assessing like, wait a minute. Okay. What's it really take to stay healthy? Did I properly prepare? Cause at that point I've got what I've got. Right. I basically trained myself through college after done playing baseball as a decathlete that worked out very well for me. You know, I felt like it, it, it forced me to balance my running. It forced me to balance off out, balance my strength. Because yep. I was such a strength athlete. Yep. Um, it forced you to get good at everything. It, it has, That's really what the yeah. tactical fitness world really requires, you know, to get good at all those elements of fitness. That's a great idea. Yeah. So that's, that's really the, that was the big pill. I, I you know, I, I say at some point, you, you know, you have to be a runner if you're not a runner. At some point, you have to become a swimmer if you need to learn to swim. Like you have to immerse yourself in that sport and treat it as, as such. And I think that that's the big thing is like, yes, I know guys who want to swim, want to run, but if you really need, truly need improvement in that swimming, well, you need to learn to swim, for example, not just go beat yourself up in a pool and yeah. hope that you learn along the way. Right. So moving fast, fast forward there, it's just, you know, my evolution right now currently is that you know, because I don't have a, a facility in the same way that you do a manor, mine cycles a bit different. My cycle begins, it, it is initiated in the same way. It's like I have this, the same process of cycling my guys through like periodically, but it's like when I get them, I'm not sure where in that cycle they're at. Right. So it's, they have their own cycle. So I grab, you know, get two, three, four, five guys through a period of time. It's like, I got to see where I get them. I'm like, okay, you're in the middle of X training. You're in the middle of Y training. Or like, you should be doing this, but you're doing that. Right. Your strengths and weaknesses are going to yeah. drive that as well. Yeah. So it's the same thing, folks. It's just what, because here's the, here's, here's, let me give you guys like the, the secret from my perspective is this, is like, Stu has this system that's just in this constant state of steady rotation that's holistic and it's healthy and we know the process at the end of it, right? It's you assimilate, right? Hey, in the winter we do this, in the spring we do this, in the summer we do this, and then your guys come in and the process is, isn't, 
it's it's not uh, it's because it's so well thought out guys can assimilate into it they don't need to look around and go I don't know how to do this right because also because you have other participants that have been assimilated that are also part of that process getting you and getting them seamlessly put in because if people have a hard time getting in your system they don't belong Oh it's sure. Their friction. It's they're the ones resistant. Well, right? also too, it has to your your program has to be flexible. So I get a you know, football college football player that comes in that's 250. You know, the last thing I really want him to do is do our heavy lift cycle. Yes. Right? I'm going to pull him out and it's like, "Hey, we're on the we're on the elliptical and treadmill and biking and biking and swimming." Yeah, right, doing some calisthenics. We might play around with some lifts, but instead of a five set of five, maybe do a two set of five, and then we're out. Yeah, we're doing more. So cardio. let me say something too: is that just just so you understand this, and, and and very few people understand this, unfortunately, as coaches. But I need you all as like, if you're going to receive instruction from a coach, you need to understand this, folks. Is that you know, Stu is explaining this. Let's say, like, how many how many folks this morning did you have in the pool, right? How many? Yeah, you, about 20? 18. Yeah. Something. Okay, so, for example, like, in all 18 of these men and women have different levels of competency in the water and the weight room. And so a lot of you might be thinking, and if you coaches are thinking this too, I'm sorry. Okay. This is something that needs to be learned, not taught. All 18 of his swimmers need to be able – need to be coached at the highest possible level – at like with specificity in mind, like as far as Stu's attention, Stu can only do that is if he's receiving his, these, these athletes and making sure that they, he's assimilating. He's like, okay, this is where your capability lies. This is what you're doing. Don't pay attention to anyone else. This is right. what you're doing. Yeah. And so if, if Stu sets that groundwork right away, he's not being pulled away from the athletes at times. He's able to bounce around constantly and keep giving people input because people aren't going, well, why don't I swim in 830? Because right away it goes, stop. Before you even think 830, you need to be able to do this, this, and this. So for the next two hours, you're going to work on this, this, and this. Okay? And that's what you get from good coaching, right? And, and I'm bringing this up for, because I've been in hundreds, if not more, like maybe a 1,000 weight rooms, right, where I've seen people like, well, what are those guys doing? And they're like, well, I'm too busy. I'm focusing on these guys. I can't really do it. Like, man, that, that right there just shows that you didn't prepare the space and, and you didn't coach. And so that's what the thing is, is folks is like, my, my soapbox speech is this, you know, whatever process, whatever program you get involved in, especially when it comes to special forces program, I'm going to say this is that there's got to be a continuum because because there is no season and because it's almost like a moving target, no pun intended, you have got to be ready to make changes constantly because we're not, because it's not sport, because it's not objective criteria. Like you've got to be able to hit this ball. You've got to be able to run to first base. You got to, no, no, no. Like granted there are times that people are trying to get better at and, you know, reps and sets, but you have to, you have to embrace the system. If you're getting involved in a training program that is the most difficult training program in the world, you better have a system in place that when you run into something, whether it's an injury or overtraining, you got to go, now what? Well, there's no continuum for this program, so what do I do? I just stop working out, right? There's got to be options like, oh, my legs are killing me. Now what? We'll get in the pool. Oh, my legs are killing me. Well, let's work on our push-ups now. My legs are killing me. Let's work on, let's work on the rhythm and position of these – of just – of just tempos, right? And it's there's so much value to that, um, and so that's that's why just kind of my soapbox speech is that no matter what Stu and I do as a living, you know, for a living, if you look at the you know from the if we if both Stu and I get it get a group of ten athletes six months later, you will see the progression to be very similar in a year, even if we get ten different candidates, because we know that the process that we're moving along is that we can adapt to it. Okay, sure. because we're not condensing our timeline for you all. We're we got guys coming in and they're going, I want to go to Buds in four months. We're saying, give it a year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a yeah. good point. Um, well, tell me this. Um, I, I kind of have this seasonal periodization program. I know you use a block system. Yeah. Explain that a little bit because that is a really great methodology 
uh, behind it because I have found that I've had to block out a season depending on the athlete's abilities, you know, yeah. and make those changes the way you do. Yeah, I think I think the block block model or just think of it as like literally blocks. Like imagine you have a bunch of wooden blocks, right? And each one is like legs day, running. Like each is a block of an exercise, right? And depending on the stimulus, you that block. It's like you, we've all been to the gym or the track. Like man, <clears throat> my my level of soreness is probably impeding my effort. Okay, when that happens, I want to be able to take that block and move it away and put a block in there that is not quite so severe. And that's what Stu is doing. And that's it. It's exactly why he has the foam rollers and those, mo those mobility times. And, and he modulates, he's, he's weight training and then gets in the water. He runs and gets in the water to offload. And so my point is, is that the block model works really well, but in order to really run the block model to the best of your ability as an athlete, you've got to get to a point where you're like, you are admitting when you're too sore. You are admitting when you're okay. Because it, it, ego, it's the opposite. When you say, I've had some really tough training days. I need to down-regulate. I need to do some foam rolling or a light swim so I can come back tomorrow and kick myself in the ass again. Yes, that's what we want. We don't want to go, well, screw it, man. This is what it takes to be a SEAL. I got, I guess I got to suck it up and go through it. Well, now you've, in, instead of taking a light day and then, back to 100%, you've charged into a program at 70%, and the next day you're at 60%, and the yeah. next day you're at 60%, next day you're at 55%, and then bronchitis sets in. Yeah, so, or over <laughs> use. Overuse, right? So, plants and, yeah. 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 So I look at block model as a way to, like, it, it only is – the modifications needed on most programming – it allows you to kind of overreach a little bit. We want you to overreach like, Oh, that was a tough program. Well, what does my next day look like? It's like, uh, it's not, I'm not ready for this heavy deadlift day. Well then don't do a heavy deadlift day. Take that block and move it away. Go through the whole programs and go, well, that back day looks way better. You can put it in or you just go, well, I'm just going to do, do some calisthenics, get in the swim, do a foam roller, this, that, and the other. And then that block just, instead of going away, it just shifts to the right. Yeah. right? It's like, I don't want to omit it. Um, yeah, that's the thing is we don't want to omit training days. We just want to slide them, slide them to the right when we can accommodate. And if we slide them to the right and can't accommodate, it became an off day. Absolutely. You know, and, and so, so what you're talking about when you do the block periodization is it can be a true micro block, which is just a day. Yeah. You know, that's, that's what I do because I have in my system, Thursday is my mobility day. However, after a kick-ass Monday and Tuesday in the heat and the humidity of July, we just moved our mobility day to Wednesday. Yeah. We're done, right? And I need a day where I don't sweat profusely and lose eight pounds per yeah. workout, right? So just bumped it over to the left a little bit and put it there you know, and, and re-engage with it. But it's also a cycle. You, know, you can put a whole cycle in that block and just say, all right, so you're kind of banged up right now from running. We're going to get out of running and go right into a lift cycle and let's rebuild your legs, you know, and, and do that or, you know, do a cycle of four weeks of non-impact activity, right? Yep. So think about block periodization as what your body really needs and, you know, put those pieces together on a micro cycle or yeah. ma sort of macro cycle, I guess, yeah. if you want to that's a sense how you like, define micro macro. If you, again, if you were to take Stu and I and physically lay out, a, you know, the, the, the training program that he has his athletes going every single day, if we were to take that, write that program out, right. And over 365 days and then do the program that I lay out for an athlete for 365, what you're going to notice in there is that our training volume is absurd. Why is it? Abs it's really high. It's like, well, wait a minute. Like these guys are training 30%, 40% over the year, more than, more than most people that are, you know, <clears throat> that are training on their own over a year. Why is that? Why are we able to train such a high volume on our athletes? It's because we prioritized equally those one days off because that one day off allows you to train your ass off for six. Yeah, typically, or maybe five. Maybe it's a three on one off, two on one off, 
three or four on one. You know, you, yeah. That's the thing is like, because at the end of the day, by taking these days off, if you look at the end of 365, you will actually see that Stu and I have fewer days off than your average workout because we've made a point to. And then you're like, and, and the average intensity per training program is going to have much higher volume because we've made a point to take those days off instead of, again, like, oh, I'm just going to keep training. So most of our training days were at an 85 to 90 percent efficiency rate. And we're we train 300 days a year. Well, if you don't throttle back, you end up instead of reaching that 90, 95 percentile all the time. Everyone's just training at a 70 percent workload. And now cumulative workload over the year is much lower than Stu and I. Yeah. And so we're going, well, how can you guys train so much? It's because of the off days. It's not because we're just putting more in our program. True. The off days allow Stu and I to put the screws to our athletes. And they do it and they, and they respond every time because that's what our job is. Our job is to put the load, put, put the work in there for on you guys. But it's also our job to, as a coach to go, that's too much. Yep. Okay. It's the job, the coach of the, the job of the coach to also say that's enough. Yeah. And you know what? It's also that, and you also need to realize what's good enough, right? Yes. Not only as the coach, but as the, the student, because if you can already run a 24 minute four mile timed run, you know, you don't need to run 22. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't need to try to run faster than that. Yeah. In fact, you can have a bad day and drop it down to 26 and still beat 90% of people in your class. Yeah, someone emailed me yesterday, uh, said, hey, I'm running a 640 mile and a half. Wow. 17 years old, like 153 pounds or whatever he said he was. Well, where would those weaknesses be maybe? Right, and so he's like, no, and this is the thing. He goes, I want to run faster. Which program? And I said, hypertrophy. <laughs> That's what I said. Cause it's like your six minute mile and a half is going to do this. You're going to end up with six pull-ups, right. 35 push-ups, and a log will crush you. Yeah. So the day of the, I, I don't, man, here's the deal. Like, yes, there are, yes, there are, yes, yes, yes. There are small guys, air quotes, that go through selection. Yes. There are guys that are 5'3", 150 pounds, but I'm going to tell you right now, no 5'3", 150 pound dude is going to carry my ass off the battlefield when I'm fully kitted up. I've seen it. I've yeah. seen it fail. Yeah. No 150 pound seal was carrying me or my wounded buddies off the battlefield. Like that's the deal. Can 150 pound guy? Yeah, there's, there's 150 pound guys that are ridiculously strong, but that 150 pound dude compared to 220 pound or 240 pound guy, you're not, to me, I just, I don't see it. I don't, yeah. like, I just don't, not, not that, again, not to say that it can't happen and not to say that I don't know plenty of guys that are smaller, that, that, that never had an issue. Okay. But I'm just looking at the percentages and the numbers going, we don't need it to be 220 either. Right. That's not also what I'm not saying. I'm just saying that, if you go, if you if you allow your if you allow yourself the long enough training pipeline, right, which is they'll say a year and year and a half, what is going to happen is, especially if you're in a good training program, you're going to end up somewhere probably around 170 pounds, and you're going to be a good runner, a great swimmer. Calisthenics won't be an issue. Overtraining is not going to be an issue. That's typically what happens. Yes, and that's phase one and phase two of tactical fitness. Now, Jeff alluded to something that I call phase three of tactical fitness, which is when you are active duty at your team, right? Notice what those guys do. They run a lot less. They lift a lot more because why? They need that extra strength on the battlefield to carry their buddies off if they need to, yeah. right? They're, and that's not also not to say we're not omitting – we're, no. not, we're, we're not omitting the aerobic need with a little bit more muscle mass. I'm saying a little bit more, right? The 140-pound you and the 165-pound you, the capacity to run a greater distance and carry heavier load exists within the 160-pound man or woman, not the 130. Yep. And so there is a point of diminishing returns. But in the same way, you're not going to have a world-class 170-pound marathoner either. 
they're going to be about 110 pounds. Right. So again, that's not to say it's like, why do you want a six minute mile? When an eight minute mile and a half is smoking fast, Oh, that guy that's eight did just did an eight and a half minute mile. He's two hundred and fifteen pounds. Holy crap! Yeah, yeah. Some, and the thirty pull ups. That's the difference. Is yeah. like if you have a someone that's one hundred and fifty and someone that's two ten, and they have the same PT scores. Oh yeah, <laughs> that that's me. Like that was me. Is like yeah. I had the same PT scores as the one hundred and forty pound dude, but I'm two hundred plus. Same with you, Stu. You're two hundred pounds with the same PT scores as the guy that's one hundred and forty, and you're like. Oh, I want the guy that's 200 pounds. Yes. Yeah. You, know how, you know, another way I used to grade PSTs was I took the guy's body weight and I subtracted it. So you know how when you, yep. put the, you, know, you put the seconds of the swim, the seconds in the run together, and then you subtract the reps of the calisthenics, you know, and pull-ups get extra points. Yep. Right? So the lowest number wins. So what I started doing – is I subtracted body weight from it too and added an even lower score. So if two guys had a 600, right, but one guy's 150 and one guy's 200, he now has – Huge advantage, yeah. 50 points extra. Yeah. You know, because uh, he's 200 pounds getting those same scores. I yeah. thought that was a great way to kind of put everybody on the same playing field of uh, – You of, bet. So anyway, that – that was and, that, and see, here's the thing. I guess the last thing I got to say about this, because like, now we're kind of talking body weight and optimal optimization. It's really not about body weight. What it is about if, if, if the training program that you're in is, is the proper timeline, right? A year, year and a half, whatever it may be. Within that proper air quotes, again, timeline, you're able to figure this stuff out, right? You're able to be a bit heavier and see how your runs and go, Oh, I'm a bit heavier than I want to be. There's enough time to then really cut that weight down and not lose your gains. And so that's the thing is given the right timeline, all of this stuff, like of like, what's the right body weight? Okay. What are the best scores? Like if you do, if you're really approaching your training uh, authentically over a year, well, you've just worked through, you've, you've had enough time to work through these issues, not just from a physical standpoint, but from emotionally, you're like, okay, yeah, I've got this. Okay, I was worried about it, but I see it's coming together. Uh, the process is working good. Just shut up and go. And yeah, and strategically, you're, you're smarter about use of energy, Yeah. right? And you're more efficient with your day, which increases your work capacity significantly. So, you know, some time under strain, will will help you you know figure out where you need to be and what is most optimal for you so give yourself time be patient jeff and i have been saying this for years now you know you got to get be patient with your training and don't go just because you turn 18 years old right yeah. that that's not a reason to sign on the dotted line and join the military you yeah. should go when you are ready yeah i think 18 is that start where you're going okay the, the work that I put in now, how do I say this? When you're 16 and putting all this work in, that adaptation looks like a 16-year-old putting work in. And what I mean is like when they're 18, you're putting in that same, same work as you would have 16. That adaptation is much, much more profound usually. Yeah. And, it's, and from the emotional side, it gives you that, oh, okay. Like, yeah, the 18-year-old me – the way that I put on muscle and improve my run times way different than a 16 year old. It's yep. way better. It's way, way better. So it, I just say, when you get to 18, that light bulb, that, that, that a flame comes on. That's when that flame comes on where that work can really get put in. Yeah. That's why it's like, you're 16, you're, you've trained awesome from 16, to 18. I just go, okay, now you have a base. Well, yeah, but I've been training for buds for two years. No, you haven't. You've been in puberty for two years. <laughs> you're, you're not still growing. Even, and you're still growing, right? Yeah. If, you, if you're growing in height still, you should not be going to buds, period. Like, your grow, if your growth plates have not closed off, you are not ready for the stress for buds. You're 16 going through puberty. You're not training for buds yet. Yeah. You're training to get, sta get stable for puberty. So then you can begin training for buds. Training for buds doesn't begin until puberty ends. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, good point. Like, when yeah, puberty so. is done, I'm talking yeah. done. Yeah, when you're like done growing. Me, mine was 22. I finished puberty at 22. Yeah, when you're done growing, your bones also harden. 
Yes. Right? Ca- yeah, yeah. Much more bone density. Yeah. Much less likely to get sh- much less likely to get shin splints. Much, much, much less likely to tear a ligament or a tendon. Much, much less likely because of the the, the stabilization of the joint. Much less likely to tear cartilage in the hip, right? Yeah. The meniscus in the hip, the knee, and the shoulder, because you don't have laxity from growing. Yeah. Puberty. That's all I'm saying. Good. Like honestly, if I, love I, if, that. I, if I were the if I were the CNO, right, or the chief or like the the four star, three star, I'd just go listen. Like I'm not opposed to 18 year olds coming into buds in the Navy, but you sure as shit better be done with puberty, right? Yeah. And, and that's like, well, you're 18, you do what you want. I'm like, yeah, but that's still we're still at 98.8 percent failure rate. Yeah. For 18 year olds. Yeah. So that's it. That's pretty yeah. high. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that's, that's who we are, right? That is how we've made our journey to where we are now, but you know what? We're still evolving. We're still learning. We're still growing. You know, changes occur, new ideas show up, new science studies are coming in. The cool thing about tactical fitness now is that a lot more people are doing studies on military performance, you know, mind and body. It's um, happening. So, it's a good time. It's a good time yeah. to be plugged in. Yeah. So uh, don't stop learning. Be patient. And uh, Jeff, I think this is a great one. And uh, I appreciate your time on this one because yeah. You, you yeah, just a, just a shameless plug. So yeah. if you want to hear, see this, all of this play out in person, folks, join Stu, myself, Steve Smith, dietitian, John Sullivan, sports psychologist. Uh, Officer Jeff Jeffries from Chesapeake, uh, the three of us in August, right, 20th, oh, yeah. 21st, and 22nd, will be hosting a, a human optimization seminar for the first responder, firefighter, police officer, military, law enforcement, all that sort of stuff here in Chesapeake. Check out my website on the events tab, and you will see the dates, the cost explanation briefly. Um, but I definitely encourage you guys to come check it out because, uh, well, frankly, Stu and I selfishly really enjoy teaching. Oh, we love <laughs> it. Show up. Love it. I, I love coaching. Um, yeah. Jeff's website, if you don't know, I'll have it in the uh, description here of this video, but it's performanceus.com. Yeah, performancefirstus.com. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, it's fine. Yeah. It's <laughs> performancefirstus.com. I thought it's I had not it. It's your nailed. job to remember, but yeah. I thought I had it nailed. Dang it. Yeah, mine is Stu Smith. Oh, good. Yeah, you got the easy one. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Here's a little note for you all. Nice. Never quit. There you go. Nice. All right. We're going to end it on that. Awesome. Stu, I appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. That was a great one. Yeah. We'll talk soon. All right.